Hello you dirty dogs and welcome back to One on One, the most detailed football show on YouTube. It's a fact. Last week on Twitter and Instagram, I gave you lot three topics to choose from and the result was pretty resounding. Before we get started, just wanted to say thank you very much for all the love and support on the latest upload. I'll be responding to some of those comments at the end of this video. Right, back to the task in hand. Today, my friends, we're going to document the rise and fall of one of football's great enigmas. Adriano Leite Ribeiro. In his early 20s, the Brazilian was christened the Emperor by adoring into Milan fans and he was widely recognised as the heir to Ronaldo Nazario's throne. His combination of hulking power and ballerina-like poise had the football world spellbound. Sadly, his demons took hold in the second half of his career, cutting his reign short. By the age of 32, he'd been released by Brazilian side Atletico Paranense. However, to reduce his time in the game to those prolific years between 2004 and 2006, which very often happens in the media, does him a massive disservice. Adriano used football to escape one of Brazil's most notorious favelas, secured a big money move to Europe, and then succeeded out on loan not once, but twice, all before the age of 21. His rise to prominence was far from straightforward. This is a story of struggle, glory, excess, redemption and failure, and is a lot more nuanced than is often portrayed in the media. In this video, we want to go deeper than the headlines. Instead of just charting Adriano's rise and fall, we want to truly understand it. A quick reminder that we do these deep dives every two weeks, so hit that subscribe button and let me know your thoughts for future episodes in the comments below. The Emperor's Last Stand in early 2010, Adriano was in advanced negotiations with Italian giants Roma half a decade after reigning supreme with Serie A rivals Inter Milan. By this point, the 28-year-old struggles were public knowledge, but he'd curbed his self-destructive behaviour to lead an unfancied Flamengo side to their first Brazilian Serie A title since 1992. It's an achievement very rarely talked about in European publications. The Rio-based outfit were 14th place after 21 of the 38 match weeks, but managed to fashion 12 wins in their last 17 games, losing just once. Adriano's goals and Dejan Petkovic's guile supercharged a Mengao side to the unlikeliest of title triumphs. When other teams realised Flamengo was in the fight, it was already too late, said coach Andrade at the time. After sealing said title with a 2-1 win over Gremio at the Maracanã, Brazilian football's spiritual home, an emotional Adriano told reporters, I can hardly believe it. I'm remembering all I went through. I don't even have strength left to celebrate. Really, this is a dream to be champion again and above all, to be happy. In just under two seasons, the former Interstar had scored 34 goals in 51 games, engineering himself a second chance at the big time, even regaining his place in the Brazil squad for the 2010 World Cup qualifiers. There were whispers that the Emperor was ready to conquer Europe yet again. In the same post-match interview, he went on to say, I've had a lot of proposals. I'm not going to lie to anyone about that. But certainly, what's important to me today and was always in the first place is my happiness. Everything I do from here on will be well thought through. Even in the aftermath of an unprecedented victory, Adriano knew that his career as an elite footballer hung by a thread. And while this newfound self-awareness demonstrated a certain degree of personal growth far removed from the recklessness of his early to mid-twenties, Adriano's next move would undo all of this good work. The origin story. Adriano was born in a favela called Villa Cruzeiro, part of a notorious area known as the Germans Complex in the north of Rio. His father Almir was an office manager and his mother Rosilda was a factory worker. However, despite growing up in this solid family unit, his surroundings were still incredibly volatile. To give you a greater understanding of just how dangerous Villa Cruzeiro was and still remains, the Special Ops Battalion and Brazilian Navy invaded the area in 2010 in order to combat drug trafficking. Nearly a decade on, the innocent citizens of Rio are still paying the ultimate price for this feud with five children shot dead in the first eight months of 2019 alone in the crossfire between police and the gangs. The striker witnessed this brutality firsthand, recounting to Inter's website the time his father Almir was hit in the head by a stray bullet. For Adriano, football offered a way out, perhaps even the only way. 
As a child, he was nicknamed Popoca by his teammates, which is Portuguese for popcorn, largely because his aunt sold it in the streets and the young prodigy ate so much of it. Pretty ironic, considering that left foot of his would soon become box office. Despite his father being central to his playing career, it was in fact his mother who first enrolled him at one of Flamengo's soccer schools, taking up an extra job as a sweet vendor to pay for her son's football education. Nothing was gifted to the Riveros. By the age of 17, Adriano had progressed through the ranks into the first team, scoring in just his second professional match against Sao Paulo. By 18, he'd signed a two-year contract, becoming a professional footballer against the odds at a time when a lot of his peers had sadly become statistics. After a solid return of 10 goals in 24 appearances, he started to invite interest from big European clubs. This interest was only amplified when he started to light up the international stage too. National team coach Emerson Liao handed him his Selecao debut against Colombia in a World Cup qualifier at the tender age of 18. Months later, Adriano enhanced his reputation even further by starring at the South American Under-20 Championships, finishing as top goalscorer as Brazil lifted the trophy. He was seizing every opportunity that came his way. Eventually, Inter Milan secured his services in 2001 in a convoluted deal that saw PSG, Flamengo and Inter all trade players. With barely two seasons of senior football under his belt, Adriano was heading to the old continent to an Inter side who, despite having the likes of Ronaldo, Christian Vieri and Clarence Seedorf in their ranks, had finished fifth in Serie A the season prior. Soon, he would help usher in a new, victorious era, but before he was entrusted to lead the line, he would have to prove himself twice over. The Proving Grounds Despite scoring a thunderous free kick on his Inter Milan debut against Real Madrid in a pre-season friendly win, a strike he claimed exceeded 100 miles per hour, Adriano soon found himself on loan at Fiorentina. And it was at a struggling La Viola that the youngster found his feet, scoring six goals in the second half of the 01-02 season, which accounted for over 20% of the club's overall domestic goal haul. Despite these heroics, Fiorentina were relegated that season, and Adriano would be farmed out again the following campaign. However, this time, Inter sold 50% of the player to Parma in order to secure the services of Fabio Cannavaro. This peculiar practice was called shared ownership, and was banned by Serie A in 2014. In short, if Palmer made good on Adriano's potential, then they'd be able to sell their half of the player back to Inter or any other potential suitor at a premium. If they failed, then Inter would offset their costs by 8.8 .8 million euros and would likely move on to the next South American prodigy. Basically, the 20-year-old had been used as a glorified mate weight. Maybe feeling like a spare part spurred Adriano on, when in the 02-03 season, his 15 league goals supercharged Palmer to a fifth-placed finish, outscoring the likes of Francesco Totti in the process. In fact, according to website FBreath, his expected goals and assists that season stood at 0.77 per 90. To give you some perspective, this is a season total that Paolo De Bala has only exceeded once, despite featuring in an all-conquering Juve side. In 03-04, the Brazilian showed no signs of letting up, scoring eight goals in eight matches against eight different opposition. However, Palmer were in turmoil off the pitch owing to the collapse of their parent company, Parmalat, and as such, had to part ways with several of their star assets. His partner in crime, Adrian Mutu, went to Chelsea, and Adriano promptly returned to Inter for 24 million euros, three times what Palmer had paid 18 months prior, a nod to how far the player had come. An emperor is born. After rejoining Inter for the second half of the 03-04 season, Adriano's form was sublime, scoring a further nine goals, taking his season tally to 17 in just 21 Serie A starts. However, the Emperor was about to find a new groove. By September 2005, the Brazilian had bagged 40 goals for club and country in a calendar year of which only two were penalties. In league play, roughly one in every three shots he took that season flew into the back of the net. The comparisons with Il Phenomeno started to feel like they had a wee bit of substance. However, this was to be his footballing zenith, 
as Addy's demons slowly took hold following the loss of his guiding influence. Nine days after he led Brazil to Copa America glory in 2004, a tournament where he finished top goal scorer and best player, the Brazilian received life-changing news. His father Almir had passed away aged just 44 following a short illness. He was with Inter captain Javier Zanetti at the time who later told Sports Illustrated, Before the season, something shocking happened. He got a phone call from Brazil. Addy, dad is dead. I saw him in his room. He threw the phone down and started screaming. You couldn't imagine that kind of scream. I get goosebumps even to this day. Concerned teammate Ivan Cordoba even felt compelled to stay with the striker at night, telling him that if he came through it, he could go on to become the best player ever. At first, Adriano's response was to go hell for leather on the pitch. Seemingly charged by an anger, he could only quell by thrashing a size 5 into the top corner. This included more international glory with Brazil at the 2005 Confederations Cup, as the Emperor was crowned top goalscorer and the tournament's best player once more, dispatching Michael Balak's talented Germany side 3-2 in the semis, as well as bitter rivals Argentina 4-1 in the final. Adriano scored the opening goal in that thrashing of their neighbours, a left foot pile driver from 25 yards. The trajectory of the ball seemed to be in perfect tandem with that of his career. In response to this startling form, the Nerazzori offered the 23-year-old improved terms, extending his deal to 2010. Despite this gluttony of goals, the fire in Adriano was diminishing. Every time he celebrated a goal by pointing to the sky, it was a stark reminder that his main source of inspiration was no longer there. As Tim Vickery noted circa 2010, it became apparent after the premature loss of his father, he was terrified by the thought of becoming the man in the family. And there was something else. His great motivations to play football were to make his father happy and of course, to make money. Now, with his father gone and his bank balance bulging, what was the point? He would soon turn to alcohol as an antidote for this apathy. The Fall 2006 should have been the year that Adriano cemented his legacy. However, it was the start of a dramatic fall from grace. Going into the World Cup, he'd played more club minutes than ever before, was still scoring at a rate of once every two games, and had helped Inter secure their first Scudetto in 16 years. He also had Ronaldinho, Kaka and Ronaldo to count on as a supply line, the rest of Brazil's fabled magic quartet. As such, the fans were expectant. A close friend of Adriano's told 442, we were all excited for Didico. We expected him to be the top scorer in Germany, win the World Cup and carry the trophy round our favela when he returned home. He was still mostly a shy, quiet boy, but to us, he was a hero in the making. Unbeknown to most, Adriano was struggling more and more off the pitch, something perhaps accelerated by this level of expectation. The Selassau ended up bowing out to eventual runners up France at the quarter final stage, a game in which Adriano only appeared for 27 minutes. His place in the starting lineup had been taken by midfielder Giannino Pernambucano at that point. Despite a respectable two goals in three starts, the Emperor hadn't been at his explosive best managing only five shots all tournament. For the first time in his international career, his trademark ruthlessness had escaped him. Despite being just 24 in Germany, Adriano would only represent his country a further 12 times, scoring just twice. Sadly, former manager Carlos Pereira's prediction that he'd play at the next three World Cups couldn't have been further from the truth. This malaise continued at club level, and soon the Emperor had lost the confidence of his subjects. The 06-07 campaign was the last in which Adriano posted over 25 appearances for Inter in all competitions, with his shots dwindling to just over 1 per 90. He did enjoy a brief stint as an excellent creator that campaign, supplying the likes of Slatan Ibrahimovic and Hernan Crespo with nine assists in league play alone. However, we could also view these numbers as a symbolic passing of the baton. He was no longer the main man and the team was thriving without him, racking up 30 wins and 97 points 
as they romped to the Scudetto once more. By 2007, the striker was allegedly locked in a crippling depression and battling alcohol and substance abuse, caught partying twice in quick succession in Milan nightclubs. Linked with moves to West Ham and a newly flushed Manchester City, he was eventually sent back to Brazil on unpaid leave by President Massimo Moratti before finishing the campaign on loan at Sao Paulo, where he found the net 17 times in 29 games. This included six goals in 10 Copa Libertadores appearances, where generally the standard in play is much higher than that of the Brazilian domestic scene, with Sao Paulo losing out to eventual finalist Fluminense at the quarterfinal stage on away goals. The stint wasn't without its controversial moments, with Adriano headbutting an opposition fullback and getting into a heated exchange with a photographer. This emphasized that beneath the improved physique and the half-decent goal return, he was still bubbling under the surface. However, for now, the Emperor had returned from the brink. On the eve of an important game in the Copa Libertadores, the striker told the press, My aim is to return to Inter with my head up and do well there again. I want to erase the negative image of me in Italy. I want to show that what they said about me didn't happen because I wanted it to, but because I couldn't control things. And for a short while, under the guidance of the newly instated Jose Mourinho, Adriano appeared ready to contribute in a meaningful way once more. While still a rotation option, he was picked for crucial ties, including the Derby della Madonnina and against Manchester United in the UCL. However, despite a solid working relationship with his manager, his situation would quickly become untenable once more by season's end. Adriano repeatedly failed to turn up for training, once staying in Brazil after World Cup qualifiers against Ecuador and Peru, where he was an unused sub, which must have played some part in this whole process without the club's knowledge. Soon after, the 27-year-old told reporters, I've lost the happiness of playing. I wouldn't like to go back to Italy. I want to live in peace here in Brazil. Despite his defiance the year before, he clearly wanted to be amongst friends and family as depression took hold once more. Only years later would he elaborate on his struggles at Inter, painting a much grimmer picture than someone who simply couldn't be bothered to turn up for training. I only felt happy drinking. I drank everything in front of me. Wine, whiskey, vodka, beer. I didn't know how to hide it. I used to go to training drunk in the morning. I feared arriving too late, so I didn't sleep and went to training still drunk. I slept in the medical department and Inter had to tell journalists that I had muscular pain. In late 2009, Adriano would get his wish of returning to his homeland on a more permanent basis after he agreed to rescind his contract with Inter Milan. A club statement read, a hug to Adriano on behalf of all of Inter for eight years and 74 goals lived together. Evidently, there was still a lot of love there for him at the club, despite everything that had come before, perhaps in the knowledge of what should have been. Once a Carioca. This brings us back to his renaissance at Flamengo. Following this unlikely return to form, the striker joined Roma on a lucrative contract apparently worth 5 million euros a season. At the time, he told The Guardian, there is no place like Italy where I can prove I truly recovered. I owe it to Italy. The reality was he didn't owe anything to Italy. He owed it to himself to get better. Sadly, that's not what transpired. After a spell of four injuries and more internal and external strife, the club cancelled his contract just seven months into his three-year deal. Adriano then signed for Ronaldo Nazario's Corinthians, pledging to regain his spot in the Brazil side for the 2014 World Cup. Unfortunately, he ruptured his Achilles a matter of weeks into training, and despite scoring a pivotal goal against Atletico Mineiro upon his return, he was soon at loggerheads with the club with his escapades becoming increasingly random. At one point, Adriano was accused by 20-year-old Adrian Pinto of accidentally shooting her in the hand while drunkenly playing with his bodyguard's gun. A few days later, she changed her story. In this time, his hedonistic lifestyle led to him ballooning to almost 16 stone, prompting Corinthians to combine him to the realms of a health club. Apparently, the final straw for manager Tite was when the striker missed training, refusing to let a club doctor weigh him. Neto, a former Corinthians player and a prominent commentator on Brazilian television, had this to say this stint to the club. Myself, many other analysts and the entire Corinthians support had a real desire to see him do well. But the reality is that this guy is not professional. He never made even the slightest effort to work hard and secure his future. Only a madman would sign him now. 
in 2014, the same year he signed for Atletico Paranense, Adriano was accused of drug trafficking. It was later dropped owing to a lack of evidence, but it was yet another black mark against his name in the latter stages of his career. His playing days officially ended in the fourth tier of American soccer, turning out for Miami United with Cafu's son. It was supposed to be a springboard for the MLS, but this isn't what materialized. Upon signing, he announced, I missed everything. The fans, the joy, the happiness of scoring a goal, but now I'm getting a good opportunity to return. After shedding 18 pounds to get match fit, he scored on his debut. And while it was his last game for the club and a stage not really befitting for a man of his talents, at least he got to sample the euphoria of hitting the back of the net one last time. Now he's given up on the increasingly far-fetched notion of a comeback, Hopefully it's given him time to focus on Adriano the man as opposed to Adriano the emperor. And it's telling that despite all of his troubles off the pitch, this isn't how the football community remember him. And hopefully he finds some comfort and solace in that. Adriano once said, I couldn't complete my career as a whole. Something's happened and pushed me away from football. I can say my career stopped at the half. So if in the next stage of his life, he can wrestle control from those demons and find a lasting sense of peace, well, I reckon that would represent a bigger victory than he ever claimed on the football pitch. And now and forever, I think he'll remain the emperor in the hearts of every single football fan. That's it for this week's one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much for watching. Get your ideas for future episodes in the comments below. We're gonna move quickly on to a new section now, which is replying to your comments from previous videos. Right, let's start at the top here. Nepali Life said, that half muffled voice when Chris was submerged underwater was class. That was the work of George Wright. Didn't have time last week. That's the only episode of one-on-one -on -one I've not edited. Maybe it showed. Mr. Grido. Inter fans opened bottles of their finest wines when it was announced that PSG will buy him some weeks ago. Brackets, 100% true. Close brackets. Trying to think of the finest wine I've ever drank. Actually went on a wine tour in South Africa and disgraced myself. True story, fell asleep in a vineyard. Someone lobbed a flip-flop at me, hit me in the ball. I got really angry, threw it back, cleaned out a table of wine. Uh, and this was in the same city where one of my friends cartwheeled accidentally into his girlfriend. Yeah, they were, they were cartwheel racing, I believe. Uh, and broke a rib. So not a good afternoon. Good wine, though. Uh, Ninta4 made a very good point about a detail being missed where he was citing injury problems when he returned when that wasn't necessarily the case. And if he was feigning injury at a vital juncture in inter season because he'd been stripped of the captaincy, well, then that is a black mark against his character and does show that he put himself before the team. Billy Fantozzi has said that one on one should be a series on Netflix. Anything for the moolah. Harry B has said, I was waiting for the word gluttony to come out. Yes, you guys know that I have my favorite words. Just allow me to to be me okay i go to them when i'm panicking I'm, i try to remember this script without reading it verbatim and sometimes you have to buy yourself a couple of vital seconds and that that's where gluttony comes in joshua luchim has said nice work chris thank you joshua i appreciate the positive vibes kian burner said what is wrong with his left thumb i've actually got two pretty weird thumbs kian they're very very bendy like a shark's fin Colombo has said, keep at it, animal. Appreciate that. And uh, MO has said, you need to get paid more, which, how do you know how much I get paid? Were you the one going through the recycling bin? It was you, wasn't it? Stay away. And Augustin Cuevas has said, do a rise and fall on Fernando Torres. That is not a bad idea. And that's it for this week. We'll do that again in next week's episode. Let me know if you enjoyed that as a wee bonus. Uh, make sure you get your comments in or you can tweet me, drop me a note on Instagram. Um, because yeah, the next topic's still undecided. I promise you that. So let me know. All the usual garbage. Bye.